Happy Friday night. My goodness, the pandemic keeps going. There are signs that things are getting better. I'm Dr. Daniel Amen, and I want to talk to you about your mental health and your brain health. And tonight, I want to talk about good grief. So growing up, one of my favorite uh, cartoons was Peanuts. Maybe yours was too. It was awesome. And no lie, don't tell anybody. I adored Snoopy. And when I was in the Army, 1972, um, I actually had Snoopy sheets. Don't say anything. Um, I was stationed in Europe, and I had, initially I was in a room with six guys. I didn't like that. And so as I got promoted, I got promoted to a room with just me and someone else so I could have sheets that nobody made fun of me about. But so good grief is often something that Charlie Brown would say. And this is the third day um, after my father died. And um, yesterday, one of my friends sent me a poem she had written for her father. And I'm a writer. 40 books and um, 12 bestsellers. I'm like, well, I should do that. And just started crying like a baby. And if you stay with me tonight, I'm going to read you at least the first draft of the poem. It's called Good Grief. He's Everywhere. And... Um, Grief affects all of us. And the pandemic has escalated grief. Almost all of us have lost someone, something important to us, even if it's just our sense of freedom and security. And so as I've gone through my day and I get these waves of emotion. And I live in Newport Beach, so waves are awesome. Not these waves. Um, I'm like, what would be helpful to you? And so four things. Express yourself. Don't bottle it. Now, if you're an extrovert, I'm an extrovert, being in quarantine's harder because you want to be around other people. You get energy from other people. I was on the radio last night in London, and some people are just having the time of their lives in quarantine because they don't have to see anybody and they're introverts. They get energy from being alone. But whether you're an extrovert or you're an introvert, expressing your feelings, not bottling them, is so important. Which is why I'm a huge fan of writing and journaling and getting out what's in your head on to paper. Because then you can assess it and know, is it true? Is it helpful? And you can begin to evaluate and not just bottle it up because, you know, I could be feeling so sad, I might have to medicate it with alcohol or marijuana or whatever. But that's not what's really great for you. 
And they've actually found that people going through grief and loss, if they journal just 15 minutes a day for just two weeks, that that group compared to the group who didn't felt significantly better. So get your feelings out. Talk to someone. I'm one of seven children. And it was actually very cool today. We had a meeting with all seven of us. And we shared memories and, you know, figured out what are the important things to do to support our mom. And um, I cooked dinner and it was great. And that leads to number two. So one, express yourself. Two, stop the Monday morning quarterbacking. What if, if only, it's just not helpful. And when you go through grief, and I sort of listening to my mom um, do some of that, and I just nudge her, you loved him. And you did the best you could with the information you had. And, you know, all of us would go back and redo things in our lives. But if you live in the past, you're going to get depressed. And so know that what you did was out of love and be okay with it. And... If you made mistakes out of malice, it's good to talk to a therapist about that. Where did the anger come from? Um, But I know in this situation with my dad, whatever decision I made was out of love and wanting to extend his time with me. Um, So... Stop the Monday morning quarterbacking. It's just not helpful. Now, your brain, I don't know why it's wired this way. It's just going to go, well, what if I did this? Or what if I did that? Or if only I did this? Or if only I did that? It's actually a new kind of ant that I'm seeing in way too many patients. And, you know, I feel it creep into my brain. You know, what if or if only? Just not helpful. The third thing is crying is normal. It's healthy. Because when we bottle our feelings and we don't cry, our emotional brain begins to become inflamed. And it can come out in other ways. I remember when I was a resident at the Walter Reed Army Medical Center in the early 80s, I had this colonel who had developed this rash all over his body. And he was just the sweetest man. And dermatology couldn't figure it out. And uh, internal medicine couldn't figure it out. And finally, someone suggested that he go talk about it because the rash started after his wife had suddenly died. And he's an army colonel. He doesn't cry. We don't talk about it, we just move forward. But he was devastated inside. And as I saw him over a year, he cried a lot and his rash went away. So, holding in, bottling, or medicating your feelings without feeling the sadness is likely to hurt you. Now, four or five months later, you're still crying. That is bad grief. And because grief, if you don't tend to it, can turn against you and turn into depression. Don't block the tears. 
And I'm also finding that many people are really having a hard time with death. And you know, what's been really interesting is among my siblings, there's plenty of sadness. But we've been with my dad when he's been sick. And we knew this was coming. And we're old enough to have experienced death in a number of different ways. The kids, the grandkids who are in their 20s and 30s who were so connected to my father. And a couple of us would go, he's a way better grandfather <laughs> than a father. Um, and I've made peace, you know, sometimes I post the challenges he and I had because, you know, if you're not honest, why say anything at all? You know, then it's just a show. Um, but they had a really good relationship with them and just witnessing them fall apart is just so heartbreaking. But I love what Elizabeth Kubler-Ross said. She was uh, one of my mentors on grief. She's a psychiatrist. And in her book on death and dying, she wrote, it is the denial of death that is partially responsible for people living empty, purposeless lives. For when you live as if you'll live forever, it becomes too easy to postpone the things you know you must do. And so being there, holding his hand, telling him about my day, listening about whatever stocks he was interested in. Um, and my dad was masterful. Just being connected. And like many of you, I'm busy. And I'm like, well, you should go see your dad. And it's why I hate the word should or must or have to or ought to. I don't like guilt generating words. And I grew up Roman Catholic and some of my Catholic friends get after me when I say this. And, and it's just teasing in a loving way. But I went to Catholic school through ninth grade and I had to pass guilt 101 and guilt 102 and advanced guilt. And there was a lot of guilt in my family. Um, I remember once uh, I told a lie, I was six or seven. I have no idea what it was about. And my mother, she went to Immaculate Heart High School in Los Angeles. She starts to cry and she says, I never thought I'd have a son who was going to hell. And I'm like, oh no. So that must have done something to me. But of course there are things you should and should not do. Of course there are. But when you try to motivate behavior with guilt, it's just not helpful. And so what I've taught my patients is replace the word should in your head with, it's my goal to, or I want to. So when I get the thought, I should go see my dad, I won't do it because it just makes me feel bad. But if I replace it with, I want to see my dad, or it's my goal to see my dad, because as he got up there in years, I knew Tuesday was going to come. Then I go see him and have a great time. And so just to review, express yourself. 
stop the Monday morning quarterbacking. Your brain's going to automatically try to do that. And, you know, I suppose you could wear a rubber band around your wrist. And every time you do that, snap it hard just to remind yourself you made the best decisions you could with the information you had. Crying, normal and healthy. And we have to deal with death. Death is coming for all of us. And I've read you this a a couple of times, um, but I just love it so much. It's C.S. Lewis wrote about the atomic age, 1948. And if you just replace COVID-19 with the atomic age, if you replace the atomic age with COVID-19, it's so apropos to today. He wrote, in one way, we think a great deal too much about the atomic bomb. So let's replace that with COVID-19. How are we to live in the age of COVID-19? I am tempted to say, why as you would have lived in the 16th century when the plague visited London almost every year? Or as you would have lived in a Viking age when the raiders from Scandinavia might land and cut your throat any night? Or indeed, as you're already living in an age of cancer, syphilis, paralysis, air raids, railway accidents, and motor vehicle accidents. In other words, do not let us begin by exaggerating the novelty of our situation, whether it's the pandemic or losing a parent. Believe me, you and all whom you love were already sentenced to death before COVID-19. And quite a high percentage of us are going to die in unpleasant ways. We had indeed one very great advantage over our ancestors, anesthesia and painkillers. It is perfectly ridiculous to go about whimpering and drawing long faces because the scientists have added one more chance of painful and premature death to a world which already bristled with such chances and in which death itself was not a chance at all, but a certainty. This is the first point to be made and the first action to be taken is to pull ourselves together. If we are going to be destroyed by COVID-19, let the virus, when it finds us, find us doing sensible and human things, praying, working, teaching, reading, listening to music, bathing the children, playing tennis, chatting with our friends. And even this week, I canceled some things, but I still virtually saw my patients. Why? I love working. Work sues me. And a lot of them, you know, when they heard, they're like, oh, no, you need to take time for yourself. And it just reminds me of Lincoln. Lincoln lost one of his children when he was president in the White House. And he was so sad. And he actually had dug his child up twice from his grave just because he couldn't say goodbye. And that's so sad. But he worked through it. And he actually said work soothed him. And on my dad's last day, the morning of his last day, he died about 9.30. But he was up at 6. He'd already talked to my brother, my sister, one of his friends. Uh, He was in a good mood. Everything. He was doing what he loved. And so for me, you know, talking to you, helping my patients. It just is part of who I am. So don't stop being who you are. All right, so the flood came when I wrote this. 
And I might not get through it, but I practiced. And I read it to some of my siblings. And so the poem is called Good Grief. He's everywhere. I see him in every flower. He was a master gardener. I see him in the stunning Pacific sunsets, which he loved. I see him in a deck of cards whenever we play gin rummy. I see him in every brain we scan as he helped me buy our first imaging camera. And I see him in his big chair surrounded by his grandbabies. Good grief, he's everywhere. I hear his beautiful deep voice saying, Danny, it's your dad, call me. I hear him when the television blares too loud while we're trying to talk. I hear him in Doris Day's Sentimental Journey or Frank Sinatra's My Way. I hear him whenever someone says bullshit and no, and I'm the boss, do what I say. And I hear him when he tells me I can do anything I put my mind to, except of course, being a nut doctor and hanging out with nuts all day long. Good grief, he's everywhere. I feel him every time I lift weights, as we did so many Sundays together. I feel him whenever I do a plank, knowing he will go longer than anyone in the room because he's so stubborn. I feel him every time I stroke his dog, and I will always feel his soft hands the day he died. Good grief, he's everywhere. I sense him every time I go into a market. He owned a chain of stores. I sense him every time I cut a lemon or an orange or smell a gardenia. And I sense him whenever I make guacamole from his avocado trees. Good grief. My father is everywhere in my brain. From longing for his approval as a child while he was away working to build an empire trying hard not to care about what he thought of me as I became a psychiatrist, to him being one of my best friends in the last years of his life. Good grief. He's everywhere. I hope this helps you. I'll see you soon.